Hi, welcome to Psychology Today. I'm your host, Ann Morrow. This is a show about bicycling in general and specifically about bicycle safety. Thank you for joining us. As always, I'd like to thank our crew who makes Psychology Today possible and Northwest Bicycle Safety Council for producing the show. Our program has two parts today. In the second half, I'll be discussing bicycle safety with a focus on women bicyclists with Leah Benson of Gladys Bikes, April Streeter, author of Women on Wheels, Janice McDonald of the City of Portland Active Transportation Division, and Megan Sinnott, lead organizer of Portland's World Naked Bike Ride. But first, we have a discussion with Carolyn McCormick of the Washington County Visitors Association and our own Bruce Buffington, president of Northwest Bicycle Safety Council and producer of Psychology Today. In this conversation, recorded on April 26, 2013, Carolyn and Bruce discussed the recently opened Tualatin Valley Scenic Bikeway. Bruce was in instrumental in getting the new bikeway through the approval process. Bruce, it's a delight for me to be here representing the Washington County Visitors Association. And the reason why I wanted to sit down and chat with you a little bit, just a nice casual talk. I want to talk about what we're so excited about announcing is the Tualatin Valley Scenic Bikeway. That's right. Project that's been many, many years in the making. And here you are, sitting here today with a nice high five. Okay. <laughs> it's done. It's done, but yes, we've only begun. But what's important for everybody to, to understand is what was the genesis of this? Because I know you were very, very strong behind this and actually have been riding a bike since the mid-80s and maybe an avid biker in 1991. But let's talk a little bit about the beginning and how you were able to accomplish this incredible feat. Well, it all started by getting in contact with a bicycle club. I think that's the best way to go. If you want to learn about biking in the local area, join a bicycle club or at least try to ride with them on occasion. You don't have to join to ride with them. And I started riding with the Portland Wheelman Touring Club. And I learned all about the area, safe places to ride, some interesting places to ride, event rides. So I volunteered for some of the events and I learned how events work, how mm -hmm. you put one on and what it takes to get one started. And I think that's a good place to start. And that's where I really got involved with wanting to do event rides somewhere down the road once I learned how to master it. And I did learn to master event rides through uh, Portland Wheelman Touring Club and through the city of Beaverton when we first started our event in 1996. And so I just gained more and more experience mm -hmm. over the course of time. And that event actually is, is that the Banks to Beaverton? Well, no, that one is a uh, route that was specifically for celebrating Bike Month, which was in May, mm -hmm. which was it's a national thing. Mm -hmm. And the city of Beaverton sponsored our first event, and it encompassed bicycle safety events, tours, mm -hmm. uh, some festive activities that the city would put on, uh, educational outreach through bike clinics mm -hmm. with, with Ray Thomas, our bicycle attorney guru. Mm -hmm. And that really kind of gave me uh, the concept that touring is good, touring is fun for people at all levels because that one started with a four mile tour mm -hmm. and an eight mile tour, which was scenic, and it was through the city of Beaverton. And as I did those, we did them for about two or three years at that level. I thought about, wouldn't it be interesting to have a longer tour? And the person who came up with the concept initially was a guy named Terry Sherbeck. He was a ride leader for Portland Wheelman. And he had a ride that he was doing on a regular basis called the Kansas City Loop. And Kansas, the, and the Kansas street. City to this yeah. day is yeah. part of the current Scenic Bikeway yeah. project that we're talking about today. So there were a lot of influences along the mm -hmm. way. Uh, there were a lot of bike shop rides. The bike alley, for example, had rides every week. I rode in a couple of those back in those days. And I always try to connect to an organization that either had bike safety events or bike rides. And then you learn about how you can connect. Connectivity was a word way back then, and we're talking about that to this very day. Connecting things together. And all the routes I did in those days were piecemeal. Okay, so let's fast forward a little bit. Okay. You know, right now you, you wear several hats. 
and all of them, I would say, are hats that serve the public. And right now you serve on what's called the Northwest Bicycle Safety Council. Safety Council, and you're the president of that. You also yes. have a show called Psychology Today yes. that, that airs once a month. And um, so let's fast forward from you riding your bike, finding a bike on the street back in the 80s, riding to work, which you did quite a bit of yes. before anybody was doing that. And now here we're sitting about 2008. I ran across a letter that was written by you to, I believe it was the Parks and Rec Department. Yes, I got involved with the Tourism and Bikeway Project, mm -hmm. which had two different committees. I served on both committees. They were looking for letters of support for future bikeways. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I looked at the most is that they wanted to do it safely. And since I was involved in bicycle mm -hmm. safety, I said, now that's a perfect letter of support to write, to be in favor of the scenic bikeway mm -hmm. because the types of bikeways they were talking about, multi-purpose paths, organized uh, trails, and all those kinds of rides fit right in with our mission statement of the time, which is to help all users of the road safely share the road, and that encompassed all of that. Mm -hmm. and with tourism, whether you got here by car, plane, or boat, when you got here, safe places to ride in the, and on the bikeways. And so I felt it prudent to write a letter of support, get involved with that, and then later, everything blossomed from there because they had a good mission. Mm -hmm. They had a good mission statement at the right. time. And they had a good group that encompassed not just government, community, business, and any interested parties. Okay, so 2008, you write this letter. Yes. Then let's, let's move forward. After 2008, again, you started the fire, which is a good one. So let's talk a little bit about the group that you brought together and how we got where we are today. We're celebrating Bicycle Safety Month. It's May. We're also in the process of celebrating National Tourism Week which is very, very important because, as you know, tourism brings lots of dollars into our community. And so here we are with a scenic bikeway, the 10th in the state, and it's 2013. So tell me what happened in those years between 2008 and 2013. Well, I led a, a lot of rides. Some of them were newly emerging riders. Mm -hmm. Some of them were for sea level or intermediate riders. And occasionally I led some difficult rides. And they were anywhere from 25 to 50 miles long. Over time, they became very popular. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to have a longer ride, but have it associated with a fundraiser? So I took parts of the rides that I was doing, put mm -hmm. one together, which was a metric century, was our first one approached the Twalden Hills Park and Rec District on joining hike and bike with this longer ride. They liked the idea. They asked us to uh, take charge of that particular part of the ride. And with that first ride, all I heard was, wow, I didn't know this was out here in Washington County. Uh, just great positive feedback. At the end of the ride, we received emails and other comments about what a great ride that was as a 64 miler. Well, we thought, okay, let's attract more people. Let's have a shorter ride for those who want to ride 30 or 32 miles or so. Have the 64 miles, which is basic metric century with a basic route starting out and then it branched off. Mm -hmm. And then someone said, well, why can't we go all the way to uh, Vernonia because we're on part of the trail. We're going up to Stub Stewart State Park and coming down. We want to know what's uh, west of that, mm -hmm. uh, northwest of that. And I said, well, why don't we do an 86 miler into Vernonia? And now you're talking about the Banks Vernonia? The Banks Vernonia which is the Trail. Rails to trails. And before mm -hmm. it had a trailhead, there was mm -hmm. an odd entrance into it. Uh, it was a little rugged in spots. Mm -hmm. There were parts that weren't paved, but we managed to work a route that really was bike friendly as far as bike, uh, road bikes and mountain bike friendly. Mm -hmm. And it worked out and people seemed to like that. When that trailhead opened, the new trailhead in Banks, when it opened, we looked at the longer ride and thought, well, a hundred miler, because people kept asking, when are you going to have a century ride? Well, now the trailhead is open, perfect timing. Mm -hmm. Trailhead open, and then we put in the century ride, which goes all the way out to Vernonia and back, but it also goes through Kansas City right. and then parts of uh, Hillsboro mm -hmm. and then back into Beaverton. And so that was really the original 
scenic bikeway that we created or designed under Hike and Bike. Mm -hmm. And then since we renamed it, once we took it over, I renamed it Beaverton Banks and Beyond. And, starts, that, and that ride's coming up pretty soon. What is that? That ride is coming up August 24th. Right. And it's becoming a very popular ride. There's a lot of buzz about it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really glad that uh, that it is a successful yeah, ride. Yeah, we're, we're excited about seeing that come again. So here we are. You've got this idea. You're out there. You've got a century ride. You've got a 100 century, 100, right. 100 mile ride. And next thing you know, the state scenic bikeway program is becoming something that's real. So yes. where do you go from here when, when you become aware of the state scenic bikeway program? Well, I attended a meeting with Travel Oregon and Oregon State Park. So mm -hmm. there was Kristen Dahl, mm -hmm. who's still a part who's of it. Who's still there, and she's Al great. Al Alex Phillips, mm -hmm. who is still there. Mm -hmm. So I attended this meeting, and they were talking about the future of bikeways and tourism combined and making that something that would be attractive statewide and mm -hmm. that they could spread throughout the country. So I uh, said, well, you know, would this uh, be something that you would be looking at? I had our uh, ride at the time for a hike and bike. I had the map and brochure mm -hmm. and everything. I said, would you look at this? Is this something that, that would be of interest to you? Alex looked at that and said, this is a great route because it had a cue sheet, it had a map. And she said, you should submit this for this new project we're working on, which is the Scenic Bikeway. And so I said, OK, how do I get started with that? She says, well, you're going to need support from every place where that ride goes through. You're going to want to solicit support. Mm -hmm. So the first person I contacted was in Banks. Jim Huff, the city manager. Yeah, great guy. Yes, he great is. Great guy, and still active. Guy. Retired still, now from banks, but still active. And still active. So I went to his office and introduced myself, and he looked at everything and said, man, this is really great. And I had already written up what, we didn't have a name for it yet, mm -hmm. so I had already written everything up. He says, you know what you need to do? If you want to get the proponents from different levels of government, sections, cross-section of the community and mm -hmm. business, you need to see those folks over at Washington County Visitors Association because they have their finger on the pulse of Washington County. So I did. I went over and uh, made appointment, sat down, and the president at the time loved it. Mm -hmm. So the first thing she did was assign one of her uh, consultants to it, and then she wrote a letter of support for it and said, you might want to ask Jim to write a letter too, mm -hmm. which he did. So the mm -hmm. first two letters of support, one came from the city of Banks and one came from Washington County Visitors Association. And with Jim and the Visitors Association, or WCBA, we started contacting all the cities. There were 11 cities mm -hmm. and then the communities. Also, we couldn't leave the farmers out. No, no, because it goes through their, through the agricultural right. lands and that's where the, the beauty and the, right. the, the scenic aspect of it comes into play. And county officials uh, yes. and, and then interested parties. We developed a committee of over 30, of, I think there were around 32, maybe even 36 people on this committee from a cross section of Washington County and government. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. And you met for years. Yes. And, and luckily I'm sitting here being able to be the one that, that is here when we're closing the deal. Well you're our leader exciting. now. Yes, but and, and, that, and that's you know, exciting. But I think the, the thing here is it, it, it takes one person to start it, but it certainly did take a village, more than a village, it took a county right. to make it happen. And I had no idea how it was going to go. I knew that I had to contact someone. Mm -hmm. And I figured since I wanted to include Beaverton, you were going to start in Beaverton, because where we're starting now is right next door to the rec center where it initially started, at Twalden mm -hmm. Hills Park and Rec. And it was going to go through Banks, and I thought, okay, and I really like Banks. North Plains, I had to co contact them, it goes through there. Along the way, meeting with mayors and city managers and so forth, not one person pushed back on the idea. In fact, they embraced the idea, said, what can we do? I said, well, initially I need some letters of support. Mm -hmm. And that's where it started, and it just started growing. And then we were getting contacted by other uh, factions that wanted to join the committee. We didn't turn anyone away because we felt that all ideas were good ideas, but it started 
with one conversation mm -hmm. at one little meeting that I had no inkling. All I wanted to do is hand them our flyer and see if they would help right. pass it out. That's right. the only reason I was at that first meeting. And then learn about the transportation and you know tourism. Mm -hmm. and, and make sure you get the voice across about right. safety. Yeah. And, and encouraging people yeah. to get out and about. A little bit about the route now. Yes. It starts in Hillsboro. Yes. And, uh, and, 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 of course, you can end in Hillsboro as well. And then the route goes through Forest Grove. Yes. And then, of course, through our beautiful Vineyard and Valley area and into Banks and then merges with the Banks Renonia, it, which yeah, is not trail. It'll go onto the trail and go on into Vernonia. Now, in between... Banks and Vernonia is Stubb Stewart State Park, yes. which is a main attraction because it's all about climbing the hill, number mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And then the beauty that you uh, and the amenities that you have as you go up that part of the trail. The part of the trail also is for equestrians. You have joggers on it. Right. You have people who are walking the trail. I've seen skateboarders and landscape uh, people. And up at Stubb Stewart State Park, as you go up the hill, you have the visitor center mm -hmm. and registration. You pass some of the campgrounds. And, there's, also, a, and there's a disc golf. Now they have yes, it, and that's yes. right across from Hilltop where mm -hmm. you have the covered area. Mm -hmm. And just beyond that, you have the log cabins. I've stayed in those log cabins. Very nice. And even higher up the hill, mm -hmm. further up that hill, you have the horse stables. Mm -hmm and horse camping. And then you have some real open tent camping. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful spot, and you kind of get a glimpse of the coastal range, mountain yes. range, from up there. So we've got a lot of jurisdictions involved in this project, you do. which, which you do. is refreshing to see how bureaucracy really truly does work right. when you take a look at the jurisdictions involved in this project. And I know you're a part of bringing them together. The city of Hillsborough, mm -hmm. city of Forest Grove, Washington County, DOT, the City of Banks, mm -hmm. uh, the Forest State Park. Forest Grove, Cornelius, right. Cornelius State Parks, yes. Vernonia. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the landowners, one of the things you said, bureaucracy, mm -hmm. and through the first day in when we actually put the submitted the application in 2009, then they said, you may want to do a little bit more and then bring it back big because this is really, we think, it's going to be successful. Mm -hmm. Not one day, not one minute, and not one ounce of red tape with all of those levels yeah. of government and community. Well, that says a lot for people seeing through what a great project this really is. And, um, and I know right now you're also helping to advise other communities. And yes. other communities are looking at us as to how we were able to get this done. And I, I think the, the important thing is just what you said is it was a, a cooperative event. Yes. And a cooperative process but certainly many, many years of, of work. It was a lot of years, or several years. Mm -hmm. When the community came to the workshops or the community events, what I noticed most is that not one said they were against the project. In fact, they said, hey, we're not against the project. I'd like to know how are you going to handle this particular concern that I have. We got on it. We got busy and got mm -hmm. back to them in a timely manner with an answer and we took some of their suggestions and ideas. Now, did we use them all? No, they didn't even use all of mine. Mm -hmm. But and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But it was collectively done. Everyone at the table felt a little bit of ownership in the project and felt part of the project. And I think that's what made the project work the most is that spirit of cooperation that we had. I haven't seen that, and I retired from state government. And I haven't seen that spirit of cooperation in a very long time in very many places. Well, it makes me feel proud to be a part of the project as well. And, and the one thing, too, is you're, you're doing this, as you said, you're retired. You're doing this from a selfless standpoint, even though you're now an avid bicyclist. Yes. Uh, remember, not too long ago, I said, Bruce, is there any way I can work a deal where I can pay you? And you said, no, I don't want to be paid for this. Tell me a little bit what you were thinking at, at that moment when... Well, when I said, is there a way that we can pay you because of everything you do? You didn't miss a meeting. You didn't miss a workshop. You didn't miss a public hearing. Well, our organization started through the Beaverton Police Department, mm -hmm. and we were all volunteers. We had a committee of 35 people. We were known as the Beaverton Bicycle Safety Committee, putting on projects and programs that, that serve the community. 
without charge. Mm -hmm. I have never thought of this as something that I would want to do for a living or to get paid for because it's a passion. It's something that I enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. And I knew going in that if I decided I wasn't having fun with it, I would quit. Mm -hmm. My wife is also co-founder of the whole project. I have to say that because we financed the first three years of the Beaverton Bicycle Safety Committee. Mm -hmm. And then when we launched the Northwest Bicycle Safety Council, the city uh, said, yeah, we'll partner with you. If you want to become a 501c3, that's great. We did. There are partners to this day. And we financed that too. When you're passionate about something, and there's something you really enjoy mm -hmm. doing, and people see that, they want to do it with you. And that's why I say to people, if there's something you really love doing, go do it. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no reason not mm -hmm. to do it. And I worked for 47 years to right. boot. So you, you, you look at that, and you just need to get that spark into one person mm -hmm. and then let it grow. The other thing I did, too, is I stepped back and became a worker bee. It's no longer my project. This project belongs to the community. It belongs to all the people who came to the table. Mm -hmm. It belongs to the people that we put in leadership. Our committee had a chairman. Jim mm -hmm. Huff was the first chairman. The committee wanted to uh, appoint someone to head the entire project, so we went to WCVA. Mm -hmm. The president of WCVA is the head of this program and project. And I might say, uh, does a very fine job. I have been so impressed with the staff, and I, I've mentioned this before at WCVA. Appreciate when, that. When you walk in, uh, they are all over anything that they can do for you. I find them to, to even be jovial. Now, how many places do you go into that every request you make within the confines of what they mm -hmm. can do is met? There's no excuses. It's provided now. And this, I, I know bike shops will tell you the same thing. They help create a map. We created a, a Washington County bicycle yeah, map. Here, same people. Right. right. Here's, the, a, here's a sample of the map. Same yes. people created the entire mm -hmm. map. And it also has sections of places to ride with different skill sets. That was all done with the cooperation of WCVA and everyone else who had input on this map. I, I just can't say enough about it because to this very day, I'm very excited about the project. I was excited about it from the first conversation. Mm -hmm. And I know that people who come out and ride this scenic bikeway, they're going to say the same thing people said at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. It really is something. Now, I haven't ridden it, and I know you're going to get me on a bike. We'll get right? you out there. But you're going to have to get me on a bike pretty soon. So I am physically in tune, so to speak, to be able to ride that. Because right now, we're having some discussions about uh, what we do when we actually cut the ribbon. Yes. And because those signs will be going up, we hope in June people will start to see yes. the scenic bikeway signs, the official state scenic bikeway signs. And then we're getting ready to plan a nice big ride. Well, you said something very interesting and very mm -hmm. important, that you're not riding a bike right now. But with Northwest Bicycle Safety Council, mm -hmm. we're not a membership organization. We have two boards, an executive board that takes care of policy-making decisions, an advisory board that brings the projects to the table that are implemented by mm -hmm. the executive board. Half of our organizations do not ride bicycles. They have other outdoor activities. Mm -hmm. They're not bicyclists. Mm -hmm. So when we come to the table, we come to the table with a diverse group. It's not a them against us. We're non-political, non-confrontational. Mm -hmm. But one thing that we do is serve the community. That puts a different flavor sure. on it when you're mm -hmm. serving the community. I'm not mm -hmm. serving myself. Mm -hmm. We don't have personal agendas. Mm -hmm. In fact, I don't think that anyone that's at the table to this day has had a personal agenda when it came to this project and all of the events that led up to the project. Yeah, and I think successful projects are successful because everybody is there from a selfless standpoint. Yes. There is not one agenda, but there always takes a person to make it happen, to begin to make it happen. And then it certainly does take a collection of folks to, to really, really put it together. It takes the whole community. It takes the whole community. And, and you mentioned one thing about how this is good for the community. And, and I often find 
things that are good for the community are also good for the visitor. Yes. And when you do something that's good for the visitor, the real impact is for that person in the community as well. So the things that you've done to bring this project along, I want to thank you. And it's, it's actually been a great ride, and I know the ride is, is just beginning. And um, we have lots of other things that are happening out there. Is there a couple of things you want to talk about a, a little bit and, uh, and wrapping up where we're going and what you're doing? And, and you're seeing more bicyclists on the road. I'm seeing yes. more bicyclists on the road. Yes, and I, I've made the statement in presentations and clinics and classes mm -hmm. that Oregon is safer to ride in than it has ever been to ride a bicycle in because you do have more riders on the road. You have mm -hmm. more awareness. You have more uh, visibility, more attractions going on that you can ride different levels, whether you want to ride on a multi-purpose path, a hard mm -hmm. packed trail, uh, off-road trails, road bikes. I mean, it's there. Also, you can't get the designations that we get in throughout Oregon of a safe place and a friendly place to ride with friendly businesses and friendly communities mm -hmm. if it's not so. Mm -hmm. Because people know that. They know it by the way we interact with one another and how excited we are about the things, that, the amenities that we have when we're out on our bicycles. Also, the first time visitor gets to experience that from the time they land in, in Portland on an airplane, right. for example. You could take your bicycle all the way to a, the hotel in downtown Portland mm -hmm. on bikeways. And that's the kind of environment we have. Oregon is so. a very, very friendly biking community. As a matter of fact, when I moved here, and I know your uh, law enforcement it was your career, yes. um, I've got a brother that's a policeman in Chicago. And when I moved out here to Oregon, he said, have you got your bike yet? Because that's the impression that he has, yes. is that I need to have my bike. That's right. But when, when we talk about this, and I know it originally started with the idea of a, of a Beaverton, and we also talked about going into North Plains and, and other places. I don't want to minimize the effort, though, that not just you, but the entire committee, um, the effort that they put into making this happen, because yes. the, the, there were many many different routes that were considered and the the committee for the, the parks department the oregon parks and rec department uh, the bicycle committee actually rode the route as well as several other versions of it and and we finally and that's why it did take so many years as well right. is because not everybody can walk in the door and say i want you state of oregon to designate this as a scenic bike it doesn't happen that way so at all. it's a big that's deal right. And I also do believe that if it weren't for your passion, as well as the folks that surround you and Jim and the others on the committee, uh, I don't think that today we would be sitting here excited. And me as, as, a, as a director of, of tourism and tourism development, uh, it's such an exciting project for us to have something that's tangible and also looking at where that future of this road is going to go. Uh, I know the county is embracing taking a look at a rural road study and seeing how we can enhance that. We also have a scenic byway that merges in some spots along here as yes, well. Yes, it does. And I just rode part of that here mm -hmm. in the last couple of days. In fact, I've, re I've ridden the scenic byway mm -hmm. because it also is on roads that are really fun to ride on a mm -hmm. bicycle, especially with some of the climbs. Right. Passing some of the orchards that we pass, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, that's the other thing. Some of the farmers out there ride with the senior rollers. I ride with that group. Mm -hmm. I ride with senior rollers, with Portland wheelmen. I used to ride a little bit with uh, Portland Bella for about five years. But some of the farmers have joined the rides, and they are regular bicyclists, and they were also a part of this. So you can't say, you know, oh, the, the landowners and farmers yeah. didn't like us because they do because they're riding out there well also. this is exciting it's bringing everybody together and again we need two double high there fives you go. it would have been done without you well thank you for and, leading us and we thank you well i just get to write the check <laughs> and be a part of it it was great fun and uh and we're looking forward to doing this again we'll have to look and find out what the next big project will be because absolutely i need to keep your passion alive thank you all right it's a pleasure thank you 
Well, what a great video. Thanks to everyone who worked so hard to get our new scenic bikeways open, the Tualatin Valley Scenic Bikeways. And we're so fortunate to live in an area where people hear cyclists and really try to get good routes for us to ride. Um, now we're back here with, um, to, to my right, Leah Benson of, of Gladys Bikes and April Streeter, who is the author of Women on Wheels a handbook and how-to for city cyclists, and she runs uh, the Women on Wheels, a meetup group of about 600 local lady cyclists, and amongst <laughs> other things. And then here to my left, Megan Sinnott, who works for Netcase Helmets, and she's also the lead organizer of Portland's World Naked Bike Ride, and she writes uh, PDX by Bike. And then to my far left, Janice McDonald, City of Portland uh, Active Transportation Division, <laughs> And we're all here to talk about bicycling in general and bicycle safety, as Psychology Today does. But our discussion is going to encompass everyone, but women specific in a lot of ways as well. But I think that everyone can, can get something out of this conversation. Um, let's start by just I doing introductions. And so, Leah, would you, if you'd start and tell us a little bit about yourself. Definitely. Um, so my name is Leah Benson again. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I've been living in Portland for just over five years. I'm a Wisconsin native, though. <laughs> yeah. And I've ridden a bike my entire life, but of course moving to Portland, which is such a bike-friendly city, I really started to do it a lot more often and became a part of my life. Um, I'm also a lifelong feminist, and so I think you put those two things together and opening a woman-focused bike shop starts to make sense. <laughs> and that is your new new venture. And it you're is. Wearing, you're wearing a I'm shirt. I'm wearing my shirt. Gladys yeah. Bikes. <laughs> okay, cool. And so uh, what motivated you then to become an entrepreneur? I mean, you talked about feminism, bicycling, but then new business. Yeah, what makes you want to do it? It's a good question. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I've been thinking about it for a year. <laughs> Um, well, like I said, it was when I started, when I moved to Portland, bikes really became a broader part of my life, not just how I got from point A to B, from like classes to home when I was in college, but um, ways that I enjoyed my time with my friends, ways that I got out of town on the weekend, um, just was all encompassing in everything that I did. But um, for reasons that I could never put quite, quite put my hand on, I was never entirely comfortable going into bike shops, feeling like when I walked in there, um, they weren't set up for me. Um, that the people weren't ready to welcome me as a woman necessarily. And it's not because the people were trying to be unfriendly. It just wasn't a space that was set up necessarily with women in mind. Um, so I decided that I was ready for a career change, leaving the nonprofit world. And um, coinc um, coincidentally, I was having a lot of conversations with other women about this mm -hmm. topic at the time, talking about bike shops. And it kind of dawned on me, like, this is something that I should try, you know, to try to create a space that is women-run, that is created mm -hmm. with women in mind. And it's, it's a challenge, you know, I, I became an entrepreneur, you know, kind of by accident, just because mm -hmm. there was this idea that a lot of people seem to latch on to, and I thought, well, I can try this. Well, good for you. And tell us what your store's mission is. So the mission is to help more women fall in love with bikes by providing a space and services that are designed specifically with them in mind. Our notion is that the people that are going to be walking through our door are women, and we design everything in the store with that. All right. And April, how about you? Tell us a little bit about yourself. So I moved uh, to Portland, back to Portland in 2010 after being in Europe for five years. And I was a car-free cyclist there. So when I came back to Portland, I noticed that riding my bike, I felt a little bit sports and speed. I felt I was in the sports and speed mode again, which I hadn't been in. And so when, and so my question was, why does it feel so different to ride in Portland versus the five years of riding I did in a European city? And when a journalist has a question like that, you tend to write a book. <laughs> so I started researching what was the reason that it seemed like there were fewer women on the streets of Portland than uh, the city that I had been riding in, which was Gothenburg, Sweden. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was that all about? Why didn't women ride? What were the hurdles? What were the barriers that were keeping them from being uh, in the same amount as the men that you see on the roads in, in, in Portland? And we're gonna, that's going to be kind of the essence of our conversation mm -hmm. once we get done with introductions. Why don't you hold up your book real okay. quick? You did, right? Yes, I did. Women, Women on Wheels. Women on Wheels. <laughs> and so that helps answer the questions then that, that you're yes, posing. Yes, exactly. Okay, and Megan, tell us about yourself. Sure. Uh, I am on the marketing team at Nutcase Helmets, and I also am co-author of PDX by Bike, which is a guide to cycling in Portland, Oregon. And I also am one of the organizers for the Portland World Naked Bike Ride. Um, 
I moved to Portland, Oregon in 2001 from Alaska, but <laughs> despite having grown up in Alaska, never did have a driver's license, so I've been a cyclist my whole life. Wow, okay. Yeah. And Janice. Yeah. So I moved to Portland 18 years ago, and when I got here, my 1974 Volkswagen camper died. <laughs> so I <laughs> gave it up and uh, became a bicycle commuter everywhere. And, um, and then in 2005, so I worked for the city of Portland in the active transportation division. And in 2005, I was doing bike counts for the city, and it was like 30% are women. We got to do more. I'm really competitive with my older brother at the time. It's relaxed now. <laughs> and, um, and so I was like, women can do that. Women can do anything. And so I developed the Women on Bikes program um, to encourage more women to get out and enjoy bicycling. Yeah. All right. So everybody, I think, at the table here is passionate about mm -hmm. bicycling in, yeah. in some way or another. <laughs> What's the big attraction? Why? Why do you love bicycling? I'll start with that one because I think that um, we, Janice and I discuss this regularly <laughs> over yeah. coffee or whatever, and I think one of the, the reasons that I love cycling is just because of the joy. Mm -hmm. You get a lot of joy, and that's whether you're biking to the store or whether you're biking on a regular basis to work or whether you're just a recreational cyclist. So it was the biking joy that I think that I also try to communicate in the book, so that's why I bike. So it's not necessarily like endorphins or anything, no. like racing and really no. working hard. It's just the joy of moving around by bicycle. Being outside. Yeah. Being outside. Not For me, it's freedom. I get to be in charge of my own schedule of when I'm, where I'm going, how I'm getting there, um, and what time I have to leave to do anything. So um, uh, how, how did you get started riding? Were there obstacles to overcome, or did you just jump on that bike and everything went well? <laughs> <laughs> I just jumped on my bike <laughs> and uh, kind of changed. You know, if it was snowing, I put on big leather work gloves. If it was beautiful, I had on shorts. I mean, it was just, I just did it. Anybody? I just, I love that you say it was for um, the joy of cycling and I was trying to think about it before I got here, and I was thinking I like to bike because it makes me feel good, yeah. which is a similar thought. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was like, well, it makes me feel good physically. Yeah. It makes me feel good emotionally. It makes me feel good economically. It makes me feel good um, in the sustainability, sustainability realm, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. And so it is. It's the joy of it. Yeah. But mm -hmm. that, um, it's all-encompassing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is. That's a long list. Does anybody have anything any to add yeah, to that? Yeah, I was... I think one of the reasons that I enjoy riding so much, specifically in Portland and cities, is I'm from a very small town where I grew up. And I think um, I'm constantly searching for a community in a big city. Mm -hmm. And riding a bike just makes a place smaller. Mm -hmm. It makes you slow down. It makes you notice where you are. It makes you talk to the people around yeah. you when you're going mm -hmm. from place to place. Whether you're you know, riding to work or to school or you're out for yeah. a ride on the weekend, you're going to be engaging with the people around you. And I think beyond the joy of the actual movement of doing it. It's just so wonderful that you can create connections with people through this w activity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's sure true. So, so none of you had any real obstacles personally that you had to overcome to get on the bike? Well, no. There, weather is a huge obstacle, <laughs> and it's an <laughs> ongoing <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I mean, one of the things I think about a lot is that people say they're feather w fair weather cyclists. Mm -hmm. A lot of women say, I'm yes. a fair weather cyclist, mm -hmm. and that means that they don't want to ride when the weather is inclement. And that's fine. That's mm -hmm. totally okay. Mm -hmm. But there are solutions, and sometimes you have to seek them out, and sometimes you don't need to buy all the gear mm -hmm. at once. You don't need to go out and buy a bunch of gear. You can start with what you have and build on that little by little as you decide you want to cycle more. So I, I think that weather and gear is a barrier, but you don't have to take it as an all or nothing yeah. solution. You can build a little bit and take the wardrobe that you have, add on pieces, add on some rain pants, add on a great jacket. Yeah, yeah. yeah. little by little. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah. I believe we're probably all still figuring it out. Yes, yes. day by day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This skirt's not going to work. Now yeah. I know that my bike yeah. is eating it. Yeah. 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 Well, mm -hmm. and it's also funny because when I first moved here at 25, it was like no problem. I could get out and do whatever. And as I've aged, it's a little bit. I'm a little more hesitant of always getting on my bike, no matter what the weather is. Mm -hmm. So. You all must ride alone okay, uh, some of the time. How are you self-sufficient in doing that? I think that's another <laughs> one of the things that I love so much about bicycling is that it's made me more self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. I think um, 
growing up the daughter of a carpenter, I always feel like I should be better with tools than I am. <laughs> but I spent most of my life not really knowing how to, to do much for myself. But riding my bicycle, having it be an accessible piece of technology, mm -hmm. that if I just had the right tools, I could work on it myself, um, has made me more self-sufficient with it. So I know if anything happens on the side of the road, I know how to you know, break a chain and fix it. I know how to um, you know, fix a flat tire and any of the other things. I will say that I don't know how to do many of this. <laughs> <laughs> and so for me, it's a balance of knowledge and experience. I have some knowledge. I can deal maybe with a flat tire, depending on the situation. Mm -hmm. um, but I also count on the fact that in Portland, at least in the greater Portland area, there's a lot of resources available. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And so I don't feel like I need to know everything when I get on my bike. But I d you, know, you do have to deal with different situations as they arise. So knowledge and experience kind of mm -hmm. balance between those two. That's true. Yeah. Well, the way I think about it is not everybody who drives a car knows how to work on their car. Exactly. Right? Um, and, you know, I have, it's not like when I'm biking, I'm out in the middle of the wilderness. I'm <laughs> between my home and work often. Yeah. yeah. And there is not a place I have ever had a flat where I can't just walk to the closest bike <laughs> shop mm -hmm. and have my bike tire fixed. Yeah. So or it's jump on the doable. bus. Yeah. Right. So I used yeah. to always make certain I had two dollars yeah. rolled uh, up and uh -huh. in my yep. like stuffed in a secret spot in my bag that I could never remember it was there until <laughs> I was stuck mm -hmm. in the flat. Um, I don't even bother with the two dollars anymore. There's there's enough resources in Portland, Oregon yeah. that that's true. You can survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There is something reassuring about being on a bus route, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is a safety net. Right. True. <laughs> so how did you learn to take care of your bike? I you think. Yeah, you seem like the expert there. Learn <laughs> <laughs> from that, I think. Yeah, no, I definitely take advantage of other people's expertise all the time. Um, sure. I think the place where I gained the most knowledge doing it was actually at the community cycling center, mm -hmm. where I volunteered for a long time fixing up children's bikes. Uh -huh. But mm -hmm. there's a lot that you can translate from an old coaster brake children's bike mm -hmm. onto an adult's bicycle, and I went there. You know, I, I think with a dual purpose because I wanted to volunteer and do something good, but also because I wanted to get to know the tools and get to know my bicycle. Mm -hmm. Like Megan said, like similar with a car, you don't need to know how to work on a car in order to drive one. You right. don't need to know how to work on a bike in order to ride one at all, but sometimes it's kind of fun to be able to know mm -hmm. something. Yeah, about it. yeah. But you're right, just a few basics can get you through. Mm -hmm. Now, has anybody ever been afraid while riding for any reason? No, I feel like Portland is very safe to ride in. At all hours of the night. Uh huh. Yeah. You've never been afraid biking in Portland. No, ever. I haven't. Oh. I haven't. <coughs> I am sure. Okay. I bike every single day, and if I'm going down a hill quickly, and there's a bike lane, and there's cars parked that on one kind side, of safety, and okay. okay. That kind of safety, I'm I agree with you. Then yes. Totally scared. Um, yeah. But there's something thrilling about it as well. Um, it keeps me going. It makes my heart race in a, uh -huh. I think, kind of a good way. <laughs> um, and I, I think I might be a little addicted to that feeling, being a little scared. And then you get to work, and you're a little sweaty, uh -huh. um, but you feel like you just did something, and it's, you know, not even 9 a.m. yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Plus, I actually think being a little scared is good when you're a cyclist yeah. because you have to be aware all the time. You can't really drop your guard. And it's not like this hyper-crunched vigilance, mm -hmm. but it's just like, I'm going to think about what's happening in traffic, and I'm always going to be responsive to it. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, a little bit of a tiny little drop of fear is good. Not a lot, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, similar to Megan, but in different ways maybe, I'm just afraid of going downhill in general. I am <laughs> awful at riding my bike downhill. And I think sometimes fear is good, and sometimes yeah. it's good just to recognize that you don't have to be good at doing everything uh, yeah. with it. Like, so those are the times when I get afraid on my bike. I'm just not, I'm not ever going to be someone that's going to go out for pleasure and just go hit the hills and yeah. Yeah. realize that's okay. <laughs> You're not a zoo bomber. Yeah. I'm not, not a zoo bomber. bomber. <laughs> Noted. Well, and for me, I guess it's not so much the fear as much as a respect. It's like even when you're scuba diving, which I used to do a lot, it's I didn't have fear of the ocean, but I had a respect for Mother Nature that, you know, like there was something bigger than me. And so I, that's kind of how I ride, too, is that I have a respect that there's all these people out using the roads, and then we all have to be aware of each other and yeah. share it. Mm -hmm. But you can kind of freak yourself out scuba diving or bike riding and, you know, the yeah. drunk driver, the this, the that. Yeah. Bad things happen. Bad but, things happen. But, but it's worth it. You mm -hmm. just figure, if that's the way I'm going out, I'm going to enjoy my life. Yeah, there is a thrill and excitement to it. <laughs> <laughs> but I also think that if you're a person that is a bit, because there are a lot of us, or there are a lot of people out there who yeah. have that, like, they're interested but concerned in city cycling. Uh -huh. So if, if you 
are like that, then the best thing is to find a group yeah. to ride mm -hmm. with and ride with them occasionally even after you've gotten over that initial maybe fear because you just learn so much from going on. Mm -hmm. when, we, when we go on rides together, we learn mm -hmm. a lot. And not just the technical side, but mm -hmm. just kind of, you know, the well, different routes that you yeah. can take, yeah. what's safer, what's better. So it's, mm -hmm. it's great to have a group. It's great to have a community of some sort when you're a cyclist, even as just a city cyclist. It, mm -hmm. It's true. To just, like, yeah, help you make left turns in traffic, exactly. all that, all that yeah. stuff. Yeah, to just do it and then you figure out how you, how you do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about um, encouraging women to ride, and, and this kind of came up earlier, but um, I was surprised to learn at STP, Seattle to Portland Bicycle Classic, 10,000 cyclists, 25% were women, mm -hmm. only 25%. Yeah. And, and April, I think you've seen that statistic yeah. coming up again and again. And I, I don't think it's fair to say that that indicates a problem, but why is that? Maybe women are smarter that they're not doing <laughs> a 200 mile <laughs> beautiful ride. <though. laughs> but you know, what what is it about it? What, well, how can we get more women out enjoying this passion, this thing that we love? So, and why as members of this community do we care about mm -hmm. other women coming out and joining us? Hmm. So I have to say that, I mean, did any of us go on the ride? I've done Seattle to Portland. Because yeah. I think yeah. the, it's I've more done. important to know, like, I mean, I don't know why women aren't doing STP. Mm -hmm. I can tell you why I'm doing, why I'm not doing STP, you know, but. Why not? Just why not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't want to have to pay to go bicycling. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I bike because it's cheap and easy, uh -huh. not because um, I want to pay to go riding. I don't know. It, so Th that's uh, a reasonable I, reason. I think that it's, I don't think answering that question why women weren't on STP is going to answer why women aren't biking. No, no, but, no, but, but <laughs> it's that same statistic. Yes, exactly, mm -hmm. and it comes up again and again. It, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, as far as why women aren't biking, I kind of feel like we're reaching a point where we don't have to talk about that quite so much right. anymore. Um, we just need to support women that are biking. Mm -hmm. So for example, in the case of the STP, I think that would be, they need to look at maybe the reasons that they're not attracting more women. And then, uh, but the rest of us, I think we're, we're, we're reaching momentum. We're getting critical mass out there uh -huh. because there's so many more resources available for women. Um, we just have to keep supporting that and nurturing what's available to keep getting them out there so that we, and yes, I do think I want to be, you know, I want to have equality of the bike lanes and mm -hmm. having as many women out there just right. because it's great for so many reasons that we've been mentioning. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So what are some, I mean, you're t both of you have written publications that I see as helpful to women. Um, great resources. What else are some of the resources for women to access? You have uh, your meetup. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that meetup group because mm -hmm. we're talking about s skills and confidence and that's what helps. I think yeah. there, are, in addition to our group, there are just so many groups that are now available in the greater Portland yeah. area that are women only or co-ed that are going to be focused at um, all different levels of skills of writers. Mm -hmm. But our meetup group specifically is, is pretty much open to a fairly wide range of mm -hmm. riding skills and we've um, found success in a <laughs> format where we do some rides that are under 10 miles mm -hmm. and then 10 to 20 miles and above 20 miles so that's kind of our format and because we have the meetup um, Meetup is a fantastic resource because you can go there for one thing, but then you find out about other community-oriented groups. And so that's a way we've been able to attract a lot of women um, who I think need to feel both the sense of, of community and a sense of a solidarity with other riders and a sense of safety in riding together as they build their skills. So in these meetup rides, do you take the time to help people understand some of the things? If you have new people, I mm -hmm. mean, so you might have some of the old regulars and you're not going to go through all right. this, but yeah. helping people with some of these basics that they really don't know. Yes, yeah. and Janice is a fantastic person <laughs> okay. for that because of her city background. She's always very good at the basics of telling yeah. people, you know, uh, how we're going to ride today uh -huh. and how, um, how we're going to maintain safety, how we're going to abide by the rules. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's one we always the talk laws, about. Yes, yes. yes. And how to signal. And yeah. so we go over some of the basics all the time yeah. because it's always good just to be reminded. Yeah, it yeah. is. It well, is. and with the Women on Bikes program, um, one of the things I always wanted to show off was how to use the the infrastructure, how to use mm -hmm. the street, yeah. and because um, I think it's really confusing for a lot of people on you know how do you use this bike lane, how do you use this left turn, how do you whatever, and so by teaching them that, then they understand. Oh, the neighborhood greenways, you mm -hmm. know, that's what those sharrows yeah. are, and oh, that tells me how to get around the city, and that's a great way to get around. So it's 
Um, I think education is really key and then they'll come on the rides and then hopefully they'll start bringing their friends on the rides or going for the rides with their friends by themselves, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and just seeing that joy of bicycling. And I think conversations really help. Yeah. I mean, emails and texting is all very mm -hmm. cool, but having one-on-one <laughs> one conversations and dialogues Definitely. with mm -hmm. people really helps a lot. And so having a bike ride and mm -hmm. social aspect is really helpful. Yeah, and you find out all about gear because you're always looking at mm -hmm. everybody else's stuff and asking them about gloves and pain what years. works. Yeah, what mm -hmm. works. And what about safety? Uh, I understand sometimes women seem to have different issues about safety. Um, what do you talk about? So you talk about obeying the law. That's the beginning. <laughs> Stopping at stop signs. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, you know, I actually, I don't know that women have a different feeling of safety. I think any new rider has kind of the mm -hmm. same mm -hmm. feelings okay, of safety like and questions. Uh -huh. um, I just think that women are willing to come to classes or on rides and ask those questions. Mm. Like, well, what do I do? Or how should I be doing this? Or you just tell me what I need to to do on the on the bike ride. Mm -hmm. I guess I guess where my my point is coming from is my understanding is if you build the bicycle infrastructure in mm -hmm. a city and I might reword this improperly <laughs> but <laughs> if you build the infrastructure so that a woman will ride in the bike lane mm -hmm. then you have met everybody's needs that a, a man is more yeah, that we are the indicator. Yeah, the indi we're the indicator. Yes, we're the indicator. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and um, and that is true. I mean, I would like to think that children are the indicator. Yeah. So that if we can make the places to ride safe for kids, uh -huh. mm -hmm. then we'll have everybody riding. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I agree that if we now moved from thinking of mm -hmm. women as the indicator species and started to think of a, a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old yeah. as the indicator species, I think we would, as a community and a society, we'd, we'd get safer streets, mm -hmm. which I think we can all agree we want. Yeah. Um, but we were talking a little bit about how, um, or you guys were saying that maybe women aren't that different and um, just new cyclists are different, but I do think women are a little more risk averse uh -huh. um, and that they approach the idea of biking in a slightly different way. Not all women, mm -hmm. I don't want to, it's, you know, you can't make too many generalizations, right. but so some women are fearless and they'll get out there and commute from day one mm -hmm. and, and, but other women want to um, feel out the infrastructure a little <laughs> bit better and that's uh -huh. where, you know, these group rides can really come in handy and they want to ask, they want to be able to ask more questions. Yeah. I think that sometimes um, cyclists, commuters, men as a very gross generalization they 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 like to figure that stuff out for themselves and women mm -hmm. want to have a lot of resources that they mm -hmm. can continually come back to again and again as they build up their their skills so how can women get into commuting the, the city of portland has some resources but mm -hmm. that is an issue i think for people how do you you, you might want to mm -hmm. and especially this time of year <laughs> but how do you <laughs> how do you how do you get get going on that on uh, commuting yeah give us Ooh. some ideas well, I always feel like if you start off with enjoying rides around the city mm -hmm. and doing short rides, then you can make that next step because commuting takes a lot mm -hmm. for people. You know, it's the figuring out your route and then getting the gear or figuring out if you're going to change clothes at work or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it can be a big jump, but I would say enjoying riding beforehand and then getting into commuting. Okay, one step at a time. Yeah. yeah. And we're kind of running low on time, and Leah, I want to ask you, you've got a class coming up here in, in, yeah. at your shop. Everything you ever wanted to know about your bike, <laughs> but we're afraid to ask. <laughs> and so tell us just briefly about what the topics will be. Definitely. So this was a class that was brought up by a customer that came in that she mm -hmm. really wanted to see it happen. And it's not going to be so much topic-based in that we're going to talk about tires, and then <laughs> we're going to talk about your drivetrain. It's <laughs> really going to be driven by people that come in. We're going to have an anonymous question system, so people can really ask the questions that they have. <laughs> For some reason, a lot of people have this feeling that when they walk into a bike shop, they're supposed to know things. Yeah. You're supposed to know, you know how to pump up your tires, which isn't immediately obvious all the time. And so we want to create a safe space where people can just anonymously ask all of these questions that they might have. Well, that sounds like a great idea, and I assume based on how that goes, there'll probably be other things at your shop. Definitely, do. yeah, <laughs> planning a lot of events going on into the future. Well, cool. Um, tell us ju again, just kind of briefly, fun things that you enjoy doing by bike, other than Portland's naked <laughs> bike ride, <laughs> that would maybe come to mind. <laughs> sure. So the World Naked Bike Ride in Portland is organized uh, largely 
with a pool of people who are part of Shift, Shift to Bikes, mm -hmm. um, is key in making bike fun happen mm -hmm. in Portland, Oregon. Um, they are the people who organize Pedal Palooza, uh -huh. and Pedal Palooza I've been hearing time and time mm -hmm. again is um, kind of the gateway into biking uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. for a lot of cyclists in Portland mm -hmm. because it does provide a whole month of free bike fun. So mm -hmm. um, there's there's a taco ride, there's a pizza ride. If you like the food rides, there's um, architecture rides, there's naked bike rides. I mean, there's a little bit of something for everybody. Absolutely. So. There really mm -hmm. is. And that's the month of June, right? You got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you could go to shift to bikes dot and they org. have dot yeah. org and they have a whole calendar of yeah. all these. And you can maybe you've got a fun idea of your own. You can yeah. just put it yeah. on the Please. schedule. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just mm -hmm. anything. A, a route, a scavenger hunt, like you're saying, food exactly. rides. Yeah. Whatever. Usually, mm -hmm. my husband always says, if you put food in the name of the ride, it will come. <laughs> <laughs> true. It's true. It's true. It's true. true. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for coming tonight and uh, joining us for the show. Mm -hmm. It's really been an interesting conversation, and I, I hope that people get something out of it and realize mm -hmm. that there are so many resources. And look to you guys and all that you've done for the community. Uh, I was glancing at, at your little manual here, and really, it is very Portland specific about riding a bike in Portland, how to be on the max and all that. And and so, thank you. Thank, thank you, you all. Yeah, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. So again, thanks to our guests, Leah Benson and April Streeter and Megan Sinat and Janice McDonald. And thanks to Bruce Buffington and Carolyn McCormick of the Washington County Visitors Bureau. And check out our website, northwestbicyclesafetycouncil.org and learn about us and safe bicycle riding. Or you can go to Portland Wheelman Touring Club site. That's a, a local bicycle club, and it's pwtc.com. Bruce and I lead rides through Portland Wheelman and through the senior rollers that are slow and easy, and as well as some challenging rides. And riding with others, as we discussed, can help you develop skills and confidence and show you some safer streets to ride on. So you can find those safe routes and maybe your safe commuter route. We ride year round and we're ready to offer encouragement and support. So come out and join us. And um, I wanted to remind you all, and we talked briefly, the, the law, the state of Oregon does have some laws about how to ride your bike in the state. And they were kind enough to write it down. So go to the DMV and learn how to ride your bike safely and legally. Thank you again for joining us on Psychology Today.